uh, Richard Wilson's in town. We've done quite a bit of interviewing, and we decided today to do a little bit of an overview of you as an environmentalist and a figure. Well, I think I, I think I would distinguish between environmentalism and conservation. I think I uh, have a strong bent to conservation simply because it implies that uh, as we live on the land, we can work on the land. Mm -hmm. We're not just uh, putting it into parks and, and buying it up and then just walking away and saying it's saved. And, and I, I think that we've made some errors in, in, uh, in trying to uh, uh, spend enormous amounts of public money on these set-asides. And that is to say that some of these aren't just very, very good things to have in the inventory for set-asides, but still there's there's been this kind of uh, a tension between environmentalism and mm -hmm. conservation that, that uh, uh, you can't trust conservation because that implies somebody's going to use it and boy if somebody's going to use it you just know they're going to do the wrong thing so therefore we better make it the hardcore environmentalism is it's a museum is once we get that key it's going out the window and we're not going to let anybody know where we tossed it. So you, you talked to me previously a lot about the working landscape. I did. A, a, is, a, that's conservation. Yeah. Now, that, is that a term that you I came upon yourself? I, I sort of developed it as my thought process, such as it is, uh, uh, as I worked these issues for so many years and realized that, uh, unfortunately, in my experience, whether it was a Dos Rios, mm -hmm. or whether it was a My Ranch, or whether it was a wilderness uh, uh, road issue, mm -hmm. well, you know, all of these as examples, among others, that we got into this black and white problem. Mm -hmm. a, 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 that, that seemingly, there was no middle ground. We, we either, it's either, it's all or nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's Dos Rios, or, or and the second stage of the California water plan, and shipping it out North Coast rivers, or no, it, it's it's not uh, Dos Rios, and furthermore, uh, wild rivers uh, put those rivers off limits. That's no, yeah, it isn't going to happen. No, never. <laughs> well, and no, never. If never means anything, meaning, but from a federal and state point of view, at this mm -hmm. point, that's true. But the sad part is that there probably were some negotiable areas that might mm -hmm. have been worked out. You know, that could have had some real benefits. That could have involved use and saving and the river. Some, yeah. You didn't have to have all the rivers. You didn't have to have all the big dams and the interlocking system. There were a lot of ways to look at that, but mm -hmm. they, no, that mm -hmm. wasn't part of the option. Right. Or with, with good old Jeff Dennison, his, his, uh, his uh, 8,500 half-acre lots now on tell, septic give tanks a little, on my ranch. That's the my ranch, ranch subdivision. In Coppola. And, and that came right after Dos Frias. And you know, we'd had a year off and I thought, oh my goodness, here this comes. And here this fellow comes in from the, he'd uh, been involved with uh, uh, Boise Cascade, he'd put them in the second home business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Almost broke him on it, but nevertheless he'd been over in the valley with Jackie Gleason and buying these things and doing all these developments and he came in and bought the south end of the valley and he was going to put <coughs> this uh, 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 timeshare is what it was. I there, see. there were uh, 8,500 half acre lots where you could buy one of these and you could come and go. There's some others around the state that are like this, <clears throat> and you know. And he 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 said, uh, I said to him, I said, Jeff, it seems to me that <clears throat> this is a little more than Round Valley can really swallow. It's uh, it's kind of big, and uh, the water issue is is critical here. Not not only the available water, but the drainage problem on the mm -hmm. property in the winter. And he said, well, he said, look, he said, I, I'm entitled to $65 million, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what we want, and nothing less. 
You mean entitled because he owned the land? He owned the land, and, mm -hmm. and that's what he wanted to make out of that, that uh, development. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I guess if it's that or nothing, I guess we just have to square up and one of us comes and one of us goes. It's, uh, the way it, this is the way it works. Mm -hmm. And so that's the way it worked. And the ultimate was that we fought our way through the uh, planning commission that overruled him, and then they overruled the supervisors, and then the supervisors gave him the green light, and then I had to get organized, and we had to fight that one through the, oh, we, we had a campaign, we, mm -hmm. we had an initiative. A public campaign. Public initiative mm -hmm. referendum. And uh, that went through the fairs, and there was no on my ranch, and yes on my ranch, and the whole county. It was very contentious. The whole, very contentious. Uh, but what I learned again from this issue was that um, that uh, Dennis, you know, had all the all the arguments up there about the property rights and the right to do with the, with your property and so forth. But the environment, the, the environmental constraints were real. And having battled about it for so long, the public had a pretty good understanding of what the pros and cons were. Mm -hmm. And when they did come to a vote, except for one subdivision down on the Gualala on the Mendocino-Sonoma coast, mm -hmm. uh, they overruled that and voted no. Mm -hmm. It was all over. And one supervisor, Al Barbero, lost his seat. And that just changed the whole mm -hmm. climate. So it's of, kind of, of interesting of that... How this, yeah, how, how, how that... Uh, the, the, uh, my point is that if the public, see this is it, if the public has time, and of course time is hard to get these mm -hmm. days, but if they have time to digest it and understand it and are presented this with the facts, give them a chance to vote, and I believe they'll make the right, the right decision mm -hmm. and well, the fair decision. You, you first fought off a dam that would have flooded around that. Everything. Then the next thing is sort of a well, upper class subdivision well, middle class, type, middle class. Uh, tr yeah, cars These are and vehicles of what's happening to the west today oh and, and it's and, and it's just getting accelerated right, in california right now what you're left with then in round valley the ranching the timber operation and what else tell me more about the, how the working landscape works out well we're at area. a we're at a very difficult time mm -hmm. because the timber is gone because fundamentally the big companies came in and Louisiana Pacific came in and overcut and when they were through they just left mm -hmm. and w well left that's all they in, in essence went broke in California and walked out the door leaving nothing really as so a follow up. That takes away one leg of the working landscape. That takes away one leg and then the other leg is the ranching which has become it's coming on hard times too because of just agriculture and the way agriculture is practiced and where the small man doesn't really, you know, fit very well anymore and so that's not one of the big a options and so what what you have is from a working landscape, you have a growing Indian population. Mm -hmm. Whether they're going to take it up now and move it uh, further ahead from from their immediate needs of housing and whatnot, I don't know. And there are more and more people moving into Round Valley from the cities, buying lots where they want to have a place to live mm -hmm. out of the urban centers, which is what I wouldn't call working, it's a settlement type of, of a landscape. Mm -hmm. A different type of my ranch, perhaps? or Not as intense, no, mm -hmm. the density is, you know, we're, we're talking about 40 acre parcels, and so you're not getting the mm -hmm. density of that. So you have a large, large area of ground that has a wilderness area that has open ground that, that has a slightly growing population and, and my hunch is that the next whatever is going to change is still yet to come. The op well, I guess what, one way of looking at it is the options are there for the future. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily have it all on the table right now. Do you, do you see any story. future in that area for, I, I guess I'd call it boutique ranching, sort of the organic? Well, they're already there. Mm -hmm. they, out of the Chadwick years in the 70s, uh, we have to, some people now that have uh, carried on. The Decaters are there, the Pallies are there, and there's no question, but those people 
are established and are connected with the city. And but, that's the but that's the, thing. the vegetable fruit. What about beef? Uh, the beef is Organic coming not, beef. not in Round Valley, but in Potter Valley. There's one of those already. Mm -hmm. And in parts of Oregon, there are those people. And there are clearly people moving in the direction of, of, uh, of uh, not so much the organic, but the idea of a relationship, because it is a working landscape, that they're making a relationship between the plant life, for instance, if you're in the cattle business up in Oregon on the border there between Idaho, they have a, a large group of people that have said, it isn't working the way we have been going. We have to do something else. Mm -hmm. Well, they've done that to the extent that they, as a group, and I can't tell you how many there are in the group, but they have something like 10,000 cows under their ownership. And they have really sat down and figured out the rotation of their animals, the feed and the kind of grasses on their, gra on their ground, making sure that they're all taken care of the grass, the feed. Mm -hmm. It's like Voisin said in a book about what is grazing, it's where the cow meets the grass. Mm -hmm. It's a two-way deal. You gotta leave a, some grass. You gotta not only have to leave some, but you have to have the right grass. Oh, I see. In order to have the right grass, you have to tell the cows to get off and we're gonna grow this back and get over here. Mm -hmm. Or with the water, sometimes you have to fence them out to protect mm -hmm. the water, but that doesn't mean you have to quit. Well, they're being they're 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 achieving not only a high level of I think success, they're tied in with the whole uh, I believe the whole market chain. There's a whole market foods. Right. They're going to take all their beef. Uh, it, it's it's not when well, I say they don't sell it organically, but <coughs> pardon me, they they are going to sell it. It's a product mostly of, of harvesting the grass mm -hmm. and converting it. Grass-fed beef? Grass-fed, and I honestly don't know whether they're putting a 30 days of grain into it or mm -hmm. not, but it's very, very controlled. But sort of a sustainable agriculture it, it, thing. You see, there you are. It, this is something that can go on. Now, is that something that you, when you think about working landscape, is that the direction you'd uh, like to see? the direction I think we have to go, and I think if you went up there and talked to those people, you'd find that the government people, the soil conservation people, they all understand it and they mm -hmm. support it. Mm -hmm. But you got what it really comes down to, uh, Anne, it's a change of heart, you know. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's, you know, I've, what we're doing hasn't worked. Now, what is the discipline and what is it we need to do to change this so we can have a lifestyle and be productive? What can we do? Mm -hmm. Now, the change of heart on the part of the rancher or yeah. the consumer? The, the rancher. The I rancher. Mean, how he, how he or she or the family, they 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 been more realistic about taking care of their land, mm -hmm. protecting their grasses, uh, uh, making sure the relationship of the of the animals uh, to the land is the right density, uh, uh, having cooperative. There's more than one in it. They're, they they manage to all agree that these are the guidelines mm -hmm. that we're going to subscribe to because this is what we want to do mm -hmm. and we think it's right. I believe that. And for that reason, they're slowly getting stronger and doing a better job uh, of, of, of putting this kind of uh, effort together to where they are. Uh, you know, th that isn't to say there aren't ranches that are going to be subdivided up there perhaps mm -hmm. too, but point is that th this is a core yeah. of people that have made a change in their minds the way they want and it it, it is, goes back to this critical word of sustainability mm -hmm. and that means that people collectively have to get together and identify what they're going to do and then say okay you know to, now to do that what are the what are the parameters what are the disciplines because what's happened so so much in in the timber business is it's it's quarter to quarter cut 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 production 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 so that the tree can't keep up with the capacity of the mill and the yeah. board feet yeah. and so big trees just kept getting to be little or little or little or pretty soon you've got all these little trees that in 60 to 100 years may get there but the point is what happens in the meantime well then that's the cut ups and Mm -hmm. that are happening in the West in California. Now that's an area you also have worked on. We, we talked about ranching, but you've also worked on sustainable timber growing. Well, and, and again, it, it, it's, it's exactly the same 
more so, I think, now in the Redwood country mm -hmm. than it is. Well, Mendocino County is a great case study. It is indeed. Uh, it's a great case study. What's happening there? I mean, I've read about the protests on Jackson State Forest well, and uh, the Gap. Uh, well, we got two, we've got two land. examples that I think s stated eloquently. The, uh, the Jackson State Forest. Here we are in 1945 when Earl, Earl Warren purchased that forest for a million dollars and it had been absolutely blitzed out. I, that had been burned and logged and donkeyed mm -hmm. and, and, and it just didn't have any more resiliency and so they bought it. Uh, 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 George Bigger, the state senator from Covalo, was one of the mm. principals in that, and his state forester, and they bought it. They wanted to buy more, but they bought the 40,000 acres of the Jackson. In Mendocino County? It's in Mendocino County, and it lay, lies more or less on an east-west axis between uh, Fort Bragg and the Willits. Mm -hmm. So you get both the coastal, the redwood, the fog, and then as you move inland you get more into the pine and fir country mm -hmm. and some of the hardwoods. Well the Jackson probably uh, from 45 for 20-25 years under the state was rested. In other mm -hmm. words that they maintained it, they allowed those redwood crowns to come back, they did a little bit of thinning and everything to where then they began to get you know some pretty good results. Just they, they began to see, well look, I mean here we are starting to get some merchantable timber and, mm -hmm. and Redwood has a really good price and so they began to doing some harvesting and so for the last say uh, certainly 15 years or even a bit more the Jackson uh, forest is is cutting less. Now this is important because we use something called uh, the percentage of inventory, a 2% POI, meaning that's kind of, if you cut 2% of the volume, you're growing it, you're harvesting it, that's about an even split. Well, the Jackson isn't even doing that. It's cutting a maybe a 1.3 or 1.4. So it's growing more wood mm -hmm. than it is cutting. The net effect has been a, sort of a cash cow for, this, for the CDF and the state of about $15 million per year on 40,000 mm -hmm. acres. Mm -hmm. Boy, would anybody love to have that today in a company and that kind of a resource. So it's a... So it, there's a discipline. It's a viably, oh, economically viable. No, it, not only is it economically viable, it's a job producer, it also has a hatchery, it has a fishery, it has recreation, it has hiking and camping. I mean... Is it a model for the private forester? It is indeed. It's a model as well as the place that we should be doing more research. The hardline environmentalists, again, have been trying to stop everything and make it a park. And that yeah. to me is a law, that's the wrong thing to do. The Jackson was set up as an experimental uh, uh, forest and I think if you look at it uh, today, you'll find that it's done exactly what it was supposed to do and it should be encouraged and furthermore, it should be allowed for experimentation for the private landowner to figure out how they're going to uh, uh, deal with uh, uh, the future. Mm -hmm. And what is the future? And how do I grow trees and work with this urban society if I'm in a timber protection zone, a zone for timber? Well, that's the Jackson. I mean, mm -hmm. there are other forests, but the Jackson's the, the really the, the mother house of this. Has the CDF been responsible? I mean, I've read articles from the environmentalist point of view and they just blast <coughs> the management. I know, they do. And, and I, I, you know, I think that perhaps there have been some mistakes, but in general, yes, I think the CDF has been very responsible. And also, uh, I, I believe that uh, uh, any kind of logging that some of these folks uh, see, they don't like. They don't. Mm -hmm. They just don't like it. Mm -hmm. It is a little messy, even if it's good logging for a year or two. But if you if you see what's happened after the re, after it comes back and, and, and rebounds, it's amazing mm -hmm. how fast that stuff comes back and grows. So the Jackson, again, like we talked about the grazing, the Jackson is a model. It demonstrates it can be done, and that perhaps uh, transfers over to the. Uh, Mendocino Redwood Company, which right. is the gap, 
the Gap family. And they've they've cut back and they're working. I think Mike Janai, their forester, is very conscious of these things and is working hard to put them on a on a sustainable basis. Um, and they've been boycotted for cutting the redwoods. I know they get boycotted. See, mm -hmm. and that's why it's it's so hard because these people look. They've got to excuse me. <coughs> they've got to. Uh, generate some cash. They've got a lot of money mm -hmm. in that. I don't know, a thousand, fifteen hundred, whatever they paid an acre for it, but it's a lot. <coughs> and they need to, uh, pardon me, they need to generate some money and I think they've been more than willing to work with uh, uh, the public people. It's just that some of them will never, never accept it. Mm -hmm. It's a commercial enterprise and so, but well, generally... Well, what's the alternative? Because I think uh, this is telling also that I've read that the alternative to sustainable logging in that area is resorts that's and what's homes coming. and subdivisions. Georgia Pacific that sold to this group in Washington, uh, the Campbell Group, they, they paid too much money for that and that was the old Union Lumber Company. Is lands. that Mendocino? Or? Oh yes, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's uh, 200,000 acres that it joins some of the uh, gap lands of Louisiana Pacific. It's, it's fine land. They've got a problem because they've got a young stand that someday is just going to be fantastic. But <clears throat> they need the money. <laughs> they need the money so that they have had to sell off parcels mm -hmm. to keep it all going. And that's what happens, see. And they've sold <clears throat> it to subdividers? To, well, some parklands and some, mm -hmm. yeah, some commercial, yes. But that's the point, is the pressure mm -hmm. is such. It's, it's that thing we may have talked about before of the idea of some patient money. That if you go too fast on any of this stuff, you pay a price. Cut too fast, you have a time lag, mm -hmm. which prohibits you from being able to back into the sustainability area without buying time grazing, you lose the plants, you have to let them come back. So you've lost a period where you have to rehab, rehabilitate. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. And so the question we have is, are we going to be able to pause? Are we going to be able to kind of realize that if we want some of these things to stay in place, we have to ask the question, do we want a productive timber resource mm -hmm. uh, unique to California, which is obviously redwood land. Uh, do we want some of the great lands in agriculture, the great soils, particularly out around Davis and that, do we want to keep those rather than have them uh, farmed over? Uh, well, if so, what are we going to have to do to make sure that we can keep those lands productive and keep the people on those lands capable of making a living. I mean, mm -hmm. that's got to happen. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. And the farmer, you know, he he's lucky if he can make uh, two out of ten years make some money, he's going to oftentimes have to lose money. And he has his land, and the land keeps appreci appreciating. And if you go and drive the state, because I'm back and forth a great deal, and just look at places like uh, Highway 33 and places that you'd never think of seeing housing, you see houses. Mm -hmm. Now where's Highway 33? Well, it comes up the west side of the San Joaquin. And mm -hmm. you, you come up from like Taft and you go through Blackwell's Corner and you go up toward Los Banos and mm -hmm. then you cut over to Five. And If you just keep going up Five, you'll come to Williams and Willows and you'll look over there and by George, here's a housing development, mm -hmm. affordable housing. Uh, well, that's the story mm -hmm. that's happening to California. Now you're a city boy. You started out as a city boy. I was. My father saw that I had a lot of time spent on the ranch as I was young, but I was raised, yes, in Los mm -hmm. Angeles and Pasadena. Mm -hmm. Correct, right? Uh, do you have feelings about the virtue of the urban life versus the virtue of the real, mm -hmm. rural life? No, I, I, I am very, of course, sympathetic and probably partial toward the rural thing because I think it's such a. I think we've been so fortunate out here to have this beautiful mixed landscape in this state with so much wealth and 
and, and, and ability to produce on it. And I think we probably squandered a lot of it by mm -hmm. just letting some of it slide into, for instance, I tell you, one of the biggest disappointments when I was on the original Coastal Commission, we really wanted to keep that Oxnard Plain open. Mm -hmm. The Oxnard Plain is as good soil and as good uh, a piece of ground as there is in the world. If you drive into the Oxnard Plain today, it's getting covered up. Mm -hmm. That's the commercial. coastal plain. The coastal plain above along Santa Ventura. Or, yeah, Ven yeah, around Ventura. It's Ventura. Oxnard. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's just gorgeous stuff. You can mm -hmm. grow anything all year round down there. The oh, climate. good agriculture. Oh, it's the best. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely the best. And yet, it's getting chipped away. They had an initiative in, uh, in uh, Ventura that was run here several years ago called the SOAR, S-O-A-R, which mm -hmm. is Save Our Agricultural Resources. What it said in Ventura County was that you cannot, as a farmer, convert your lands to uh, housing mm -hmm. unless you don't go to the Planning Commission. You have to go to a vote of the public which is another way of saying you can't develop your land. Mm -hmm. Now for the orange grower that can't sell his, uh, his Valencia oranges anymore because of these trade agreements and, and uh, just the prices, I mean you can get them offshore, Chile or places, or uh, Mexico, mm -hmm. they've got to find another crop. They have something called the pixie which is like a sweet little orange or tangerine with no seeds. They find some alternatives but that guy or that gal or whoever the family is is struggling around, they're kind of locked in. And I think that's, that's pretty darn harsh treatment on the one hand. On the other, it may have to be tested in court to see if it's going to hold up because uh, there will have to be some relief given to these people. Mm -hmm. But it, what it really says is the pressure of population, of housing prices and land is just out through the roof, mm -hmm. and uh, and those great soils that have been so productive are feeling the pressure, and we're losing. Mm -hmm. That's one of the and they, and I think in general, in, in California with this burgeoning population, that's the fact of life. We're losing. Mm -hmm. Now how how we're going to turn that around is kind of comes back to this thing of sustainability and what can we do to get the people the resource, the things we can do to make incentives and, and to wire it together in a way that there's enough of them that they can sustain themselves. Can we get Jackson and can we get Mendocino Redwoods and whatever happens to Pacific Lumber or maybe Simpson, but are there enough of them that can, can collectively hold together and and to keep be productive in the you know world economy and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a big issue. World it, economy, it, NAFTA. Well, you see, it's big. It isn't just a local issue anymore. Mm -hmm. It's a huge issue. Mm -hmm. And and I don't know whether whether we're uh, aware of that. I mean, as individuals, mm -hmm. you know, we're kind of dealing with our lives and trying to deal with them. Do we see that? Well, it's pretty hard to see it because it's coming from. I think that probably the best. You know, issue you see all the time on the news is the Walmart issue yeah. and the strike with the grocery stores. Mm -hmm. It's visible to people. They see it. And that's kind of where it is. I mean, it's out there and it's the real world. It's money and work and jobs and all of it. Now, do traditional parties have a, a role here? I mean, you, you're a Republican. I'm or a, have I, been. I have been. I'm kind of an independent. You're I, yeah. an independent. I mean, I'm a, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a I've been, I've been, I, I lean toward the Republicans because I always thought they, they were a little better about uh, some of this uh, individualism and, and making an effort. But on the same token, I, I recognize that uh, they have their, their shortcomings too. And, and when it comes down, generally, Reagan, I think, was terrific. I mean, mm -hmm. I thought he, and I do know, having read quite a few books about, about him, that he loved his ranch mm -hmm. and he loved the land. And he had a real feel, and I think that's one reason he was good on some of these land issues, because I think the man really understood it. I think most of the political people in political life are are, are creatures of the city. Of the city. Mm -hmm. So and, whatever and so, party. Yeah, and, and and the money the money talks to both of them, and the pressure's on, and it's as though California in this budget, I, I think, is a, is kind of a witness to the fact that 
the population and the expectations of the population are overreaching the ability of the of the state to produce real really mm -hmm. produce and support people at a lifestyle level that they can uh, that they expect mm -hmm. uh, here at the university great example they're having a terrible time you know with their budget and everything okay. and I you know we haven't come to grips with that but but the but there's a relationship like uh, Victor Hansen's book, The Land is Everything, and mm -hmm. I, I wrote, a, wrote a preface for that, I, I think, as I recall, trying to make that distinction is that, that uh, the Founding Fathers were landed and there were lots of problems in those days, and, and then, you know, but the point is they all, they, they understood the land, and I don't think you can get away from the land. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've, we've got technology and we've got stuff we can make more darn records and tables and everything but you know finally somebody somebody has to take a hold of a shovel and dig a hole I yeah. mean that's the fact the computers don't dig holes very well right I mean right. you got to do it and that's where the rubber meets the road somebody has to do it so that that does seem to me to be a place where you really uh, uh, your point of view is shaped by the fact that you have Dug the shovel. Dug a lot of posters. <laughs> I did. Would you say that so? That oh yeah, I've done a lot of that work. <laughs> yes, sir. On my dad. Yes, and, and my dad was the same way. Yeah. He was a doctor, but he did a lot of that. But he, uh, he always told my mother that my two brothers were quite a bit older than I, and, and they they were up at the ranch, and he was making them build fences the old way, and. My mother say, John, you know, she'd say, we've got to get these boys to school. And he says, oh, to hell with school. They're learning more building a fence than they ever will in school. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I look over your career, it strikes me that here you're really a very independent person. You're very rooted to the land. You yeah. drive that truck. <laughs> I drive the and, truck, yes. Yeah, um, and yet, you, because of your love of the land, you've been embroiled in politics and actually working within a political system very strongly throughout. But, but Does it, is there a tension there? Yeah, there's a tension because I didn't start that, but I was pushed into it. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I mean, when the, when the Corps of Engineers comes and tells you that we're going to save you because we're going to put 300 feet of water on your head, well, that's interesting, you know, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a thought I've got to think through. Uh, so you, you, you fought the Battle of Dos Rios, Yeah, and then you I, went on the coastal Well, Commission. and then I had Jeff Dennis right after yeah. that, and I've had the wilderness going on for 20 years, and, and on and on, you know, and, and I, I, don't, I didn't go out into this to make a career out of right. it, but I just found myself just, as I said when we started, it's kind of my way or the, hi your way or the highway, I mean, it just, these are, these are, interests in people that want to develop and they want to open up country and they, a lot of good things have happened and a lot of bad things have happened and, and as I say, you know, you find yourself right at loggerheads with them. Mm -hmm. It's like in, uh, when I was messed up in Dos Rios, they'd say, well, young man, you don't know anything about this and, and you really shouldn't be, you know, messing around and I, you know, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> You're gonna have to learn it fast, or, or these subdivision things, and, and learning how to print a newspaper and, and get the public organized. Yeah, you had to do that, and then some of these wilderness issues, and then and then the coastal commission, the board of forestry. Right. I mean, well, you've had issues uh, where you uh, fought uh, fought uh, campaigns, but then you've also had right your involvement in the public process, the right. coastal commission, board of forestry, and. Director, Department of Forestry. But I will say, one, there's an important point there that you raised, and I'm glad you did, is that the work in the Coastal Commission, the work at the Board of Forestry, and my, my years as the director, were fundamentally regulatory. Right. In other words, you're a policeman. And, and regrettably, that does not uh, enhance this idea of the working landscape, which is where you're trying to get this thing up and running, where you don't have to be a policeman. That's the hard part, is that why the hell do you have to keep fighting and fighting and fighting all the time to try to hold these people at bay because they're going too far, too fast, or into something. And I think one of the, one of the things that uh, has bothered me is that, you know, we have pretty good science. 
Uh, and you hear of political people saying, well, we'll use good science. Well, you got to watch out because good science for whom? If it's my science, it's good, but if it's not, then it isn't good. <laughs> you mean science is political? Well, yes, yeah, I, I used to say there's a, there's a lot of biostitutes running around loose in the... Biostitutes? Biostitutes. <laughs> oh, I get it. They're out there running around loose for hire. They're hired guns. Uh-huh. And, and you can get them to write anything and do anything. I mean, that's, that's fair game. The question is, how do you get the best to come up and, you know, here's, as I say in this... This, the, the whole issue of, of, of academia and, and work, say, in, in watersheds, which mm -hmm. are, to me are so critical. And, and having Tom Dunn down here at the Bren School in, in Santa Barbara, one of the best hydrologists in, uh, in the United States, and, and, uh, and having worked with him on some of this, uh, uh, after having been uh, on, on these on these both sides, for instance, on the North Coast, trying to deal with one of the environmentalists are here and the industry's over here and they, they can't agree and they're talking about fundamentally watersheds. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, after a while, I, I, I just got worried and I talked, that's when I talked to Henry Box Jr. And, and I told him, I said, Henry, I said, uh, look, uh, uh, we need you to get a team together and just tell me what the state of the art is, what is possible, what isn't possible, so that at least we have the best professional mind on it. We don't have it in government. We have, you know, we're regulators, we're cops. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I agree with that. You were looking for some independent I wanted to know what the uh, best we could come to say, this is reasonable, this isn't reasonable, this is... To protect the watershed? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Over use, non-use, too much use, mm -hmm. whatever it is that's out there. Because, because monet, I mean, most of this, and is money and monitoring, it's, it's getting enough money mm -hmm. uh, to put people out there and through the course of the year do the monitoring and then find out what the heck's going on. And then, you know, you, that's what happens with the, the, the guys like Dunn. I mean, he'll get graduate students and they'll do it and do the field work and bring it in and he'll do the evaluation and make some kind of a, of a, uh, of a recommendation that this is kind of where things are. And were you satisfied with that report? Well, I think it was a great start. I don't know that they've ever gotten to the implementation, though. You I see, see, that's it. It mm -hmm. ran into political troubles after I was leaving, it, and, and, and a lot of people didn't want it out, mm -hmm. and they didn't want that kind of information floating around. And so, therefore, it finally got out, and then they got another committee, and they were still mm -hmm. mucking around with it. And to this day, I think it's still a, an issue that hasn't been. Uh, well, it, 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 I'll tell you what happens is that, uh, see, forestry and, the, and, and the, it, the, the timber harvest process is a, is a license. You, you can go log if you do this and this and this checklist. Uh, the, the issue underneath this for so long has been water. Mm -hmm. Well, finally, this Burton bill that was passed last year, which is EPA, if you will, Environmental Protection Agency, that bill more or less transferred the real power from CDF and the forester to the biologist, water. Ah, to the um, water. Yep, it shifted it over because the ultimate hammer is is in the hands of the EPA, mm -hmm. which is the science. It, within the state. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, that's right. It's, it's so the, the water quality. Water people. quality. They're mm -hmm. the ones that are that are that are in mm -hmm. charge. They, I mean, so that's water the, becomes the water quality becomes the driving thing rather than forest. And practice. that takes us right back to the watershed. Mm -hmm. See. So we're do you there. subscribe to that shift or not? Yeah, now I mean that's the where they, the it water just, is the issue. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, a forester that's trained about trees is not the same as a forester or somebody that's. They still need better people too. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the water people. You bet. I mean, they've got to have good consultants to, mm -hmm. to, to tell them. But at least, I think they're kind of in the right track there of, of, of 
focusing on that critical issue, whether it's the Sierras or the North Coast or whatever, but those those areas are the ones that need the most attention, and mm -hmm. they, they're the ones that need to to get the best information and then get it out there and let the legislature and people know. Look, this is the way it, it it's coming down, and maybe that maybe you can't do this over here. Mm -hmm. You can do it over here and here and here. But for some reasons, whether it's landslides or instability or rainfall or overroad building or whatever it is, you, you either ought to get out of there or rest it or do something. So you'd like to see more real scientific I'd like to see it freely done and, and, and then let the politics deal with it once you get it on the table. Mm -hmm. Let's try to get the real hard science on the table if we can. Right. And then those people can clear away and then let the politics come in and, and let them uh, have at it. It sounds like you're always going to need these strong regulatory always. efforts. Oh, I think so. Because not everybody is no. thinking about sustainable forestry and sustainable ag. No, and no, and we're a long way away. Mm -hmm. I hate to say we're, we've got these little blips, but uh, California and the budget and the shape of the economy and uh, the demand for revenue and uh, uh, you know, I, I, I just, uh, we're, we're going through a hard time, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. right now, trying to get ourselves through this. But I mean, I wish, I mean, I don't know anybody in Sacramento or anybody that's kind of trying to, I wish somebody would kind of look ahead. Mm -hmm. I get emails from people that I was on the Coastal Commission with and others that get so frustrated about this stuff. Uh, I mean, I mean, here's the San Onofre thing. I was involved with that, the nuclear reactor down there. And of course, one of those reactors has gone down. They have to get rid of it. And Edison is sitting down there. They don't know what to do with it. They can't ship it anywhere on the rail. They can't ship it on a truck. They tried to put it on a boat and take it around Tierra del Fuego or the Panama Canal. They haven't been able to do that. So the only thing they know to do with the darn thing is to put it on a boat far enough offshore and hope something's going to happen. I mean, that's exactly that's where not. this thing is. Well, to me, that's that just shows you how incomplete our thought process is. You want nuclear power and say, well, what do you do with the waste? Right. Oh, well, it just, it'll, you know, happen. And yet on the national level, Apparently, the Bush administration is I, back to I, uh, I totally courting nuclear power. I can oppose to that. I mean, no, they, they've got to, they better come to terms of what are you going to put in Nevada, what are you going to do, and, and then you see they can't move the darn thing anywhere because nobody wants it. Right. They don't want the Panama Canal, they don't want it coming around the bottom of the, of the horn there, mm -hmm. and it's a huge problem. Well, there's a, I mean, there's a short term. You get. You get the, the nuclear reactor, you get the power for a little while, and then, well, what do we do? Well, that, that's always somebody else's problem. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a real problem. And that's, that's not thinking sustainable. I mean, that's what bothers me about this whole thing is that you know, we're going to have oil for a long time, but wind power, solar, all these things that my read is people want to do it. Mm -hmm if they're given an incentive and allowed to work it up so their houses are better insulated, they have solar in California, we should all have solar of some kind. You know, to me this all makes sense, but there's just peanuts thrown out on mm -hmm. that. Very mm -hmm. little. And again, it comes back to this collective thing we've touched on with the ranchers, we touched with the timber. It's the urban. Give them, a, give them some incentives, let them, I, I just, people will do it. Yeah. I know that. You still have faith in the population. You bet. You, if the darn leadership would just get the heck out of the way and you oh. know, and have enough sense to say, okay, you know, let, we're going to help you get there, folks. Yeah. That's what they should do. Yeah. Not not be telling them all the time that you know it's got to be this or got to be that, or not telling them anything. But but giving incentive for correct policy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, and try to sell it and, and get it out there. And I mean, you can you can almost retrace this thing. I mean, I, I, I know that the Japanese are going to come in here with and already are with the Honda, Honda and the Prius or whatever those two battery. The, they're here and, and, and to say, is that going to work? Go try to buy one. It's a waiting list. Yes. You can't get. Now, where are the Americans? Well, they're talking about bigger cars. 
Right. Well, doesn't that say something? <laughs> yeah, I think so. It says something to me. <laughs> I just don't know. Now, you've mentioned population a lot, mm -hmm. which seems, you know, it's kind of a background to the story of California. Yeah. Do you get involved at all in population politics? No. I, 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 Victor and I, Hanson, as I say, he wrote a book about uh, Mexifornia. And I must say to you, I happen to agree. What, what he really is saying is that you better, you better do something about the border uh, and the impact of the population coming in uh, on the state. And I, I think I, I generally agree with this for this reason, that these people have been brought up here to work. Uh, people don't want to mow their lawns. People don't want to do their gardening. People don't want to work in the fields. And so these people, you know, having uh, been in Mexico with no opportunity, anything is almost uh, better than here than what they came from. In the valley where he has lived all his life with the, 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 this issue, uh, they come up and, and they go to work, and there's very little assimilation in this whole. In other words, they work till they break down at, well, maybe 40 years old, but they're here, mm -hmm. and they fall into the whatever system, the care system we have, and they have families. And those kids, for the most part, also kind of follow the parents. There's not much assimilation. There's very little movement up. They get into the same track and break down. And so what you do is you, you start mean they building. overwork? Well, they get injured. Yeah, they mm -hmm. overwork. But they don't, I mean, as far as an education and going on and, and trying to become more a part of California or part of the state, they're pretty much state of themselves, do the things their parents did, they're not moving up, up, and as I think that uh, the record will show that both in high schools and state college system and everything, that they're simply not there or, or trying to aspire up to get a better, uh, become better citizens, if you will, once they're here, wanting to be a part of it. They're kind of looking back fondly on Mexico, but at the same time not wanting to go back because somehow they've been able to to live here. Well, the net of that is, and I, I, I think probably we're we're not we're subsidizing this. In other words, they, they, what they're doing, the work they're doing, and, and the kinds of work, I don't think is uh, paying. Oh, they're they're over. In other words, their overhead. Their mm -hmm. kids, the uh, hospital care, the school, the educational system. Uh, all of this. And so uh, I think we, we have to consider some kind of a stricter uh, policy on the border uh, where the people that come here come for a reason and then uh, I think that they ought to have to be more of a, of a player and, and willing to become a part of California and mm -hmm. citizen and learning about the state and so forth. Uh, than to be just kind of a labor force, and that's the highest rung on the ladder. Mm -hmm. That's one of the problems. But do you and, and that's so therefore we have this burgeoning population of, I know it used to be something like 600,000 people a year in California bur born or, or moved in here, and, and we've got to, you know, we've got to deal with them, and I think probably this budget and the problems we're having is we simply are not able to meet all the requirements. If you mm -hmm. look at our hospitals, if you look at our emergency rooms, everybody is scrambling, just mm -hmm. barely, just, you know, trying to stay alive. They're not doing much more, uh, and it's mostly the cost, you know, it's terrific. Does so a lot of that seem immigration related to you, oh, or I think so. are there other... No, I think there's a lot of it's immigration. I think it's immigration related and also it's just the, the, the size of the population and how, what resources we have, how we allocate those resources out. Mm. That, that, I mean, that's one of our problems. Are we efficient? No, I don't know. Uh, probably, again, we probably could do a lot of things mm. better. You know, prevention, trying to get these kids earlier in schools, trying to, you know, on health, a mm. lot of things that haven't happened. 
but I think numbers. I think we definitely have a numbers problem in the state, and, and uh, I, I think it's when you see it in the South. I mean, you see these just streets lined with people trying to work, mm -hmm. waiting for somebody to take them and give them a job. And is it true? Do you think that the Americans don't want those jobs? I think what you would have to do is I think you have to pay the Americans more money to mm -hmm. some degree to get them to do it. Uh, I'm not sure they wouldn't do it uh, on that, and that means that, uh, you know, maybe uh, we don't have as much discretionary income to put other places. But, but I, I, I'm really concerned about this population on the one hand and shipping all this stuff offshore, these jobs. Mm -hmm. Because these are jobs that we should be trying to keep. And I, it came to me uh, the other night, Lou Dobbs is one of the people I occasionally watch because he's on this issue about jobs mm -hmm. and talking about it. And he had a tool and die man on who, who did this, he'd apprenticed and he was, a, he was a, you know, he, this is what he did. And he said, I had nine people and now I'm down to three. And I'm juggling, and I'm trying to stay. I'm trying to be competitive, but he said I'm just getting just run over by uh, the offshore and the wage discrepancies and mm -hmm. work conditions and everything. And he said it's just an, un an unlevel playing field. He said we can do the work, and we're good. But the government, when they negotiate these NAFTAs, they got to make sure that those people are complying with some of the same environmental standards and the issues that we have to, so it's a little fairer. Mm -hmm. That isn't just money either, that's just how they operate. He said if our people would do a better job of negotiating, we'd have a better crack at it and we'd probably stay in there because we're good. Mm -hmm. But we can't do it unless we get better uh, participation representation on these negotiations. And I think that's true. I mm -hmm. think a lot of our people are the best and want to be here, but there's a lot of people trying to ship it all offshore because it's cheaper, and uh, we better look out. We, that, that's why I think we better work on our, on our case right here to try to make sure that we're keeping skill. Ba these are, look, these are basic skills, uh, tool and die and these mm -hmm. kinds of people. We want to be sure we keep them and don't ship all that to China or some darn no, place. Right. And, and, and I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know whether we get it. I mean, I think that, that if you're a corporate person and you're looking for the best result, if you can get it done in India or China or someplace that's cheaper to bring it back here, you obviously do it. And we're not again. We're not asking the right question. Mm. What What do we want for ourselves? What kind of a country? What kind of a do we want to have stability? Do we want to have sustainability? Do we want to have jobs? What do we want our kids to do? And I think our kids are the ones that uh, are going to have to suffer this uh, until we figure it out, or at least ask. I, I would like to see more dialogue. Let's ask the question. Right. What do we want to do? You know, here at the University of California, we have a great system that's rocking along. Uh, are we going to keep it and uh, maintain it uh, because it's been that way, or are we going to begin to lose it? Mm -hmm. I don't know, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, with this pressure to cut, cut, cut. Are you looking to any candidates or any uh, organizations to take the lead on these issues? No, I honestly don't know of any that are out there at the moment that seem to, uh, I mean, the governor of Schwarzenegger is a young, ambitious, hardworking young fellow that I think is trying. I, and the question is, I don't think he, I don't think he knew what a, plate full of problems he's getting, <laughs> whether it's the correction system or the educational system or the budget. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you, I don't think you realize till you get into those positions what what a hell of a place. Has he are. put good people in to the uh, I don't know. resource agency? I, don't, I think it's still to be, it remains to be seen mm -hmm. what, what they're going to do. It's yeah. unclear where they're trying to go or I mean, they, they've talked about reorganization and they've talked about a number of things uh, about what they might do. And we could reorganize and do things better, I think, mm -hmm. for sure. Whether they, you know, whether you, it's hard to do that when you're just over here trying to get through the budget. Yeah, it's, 
it's a crisis. Right. So you're busy down here, and and, and, and when you talk about some reorganization things, well, you have to think. You know, and so how, I mean, you know, I had to do that for three years working through the forestry people and trying to reorganize those departments and uh, got got it done. But uh, that takes time, mm -hmm. and, and the opportunity is here. The budget problem is great enough to warrant it, but the question is, is there time enough for the people to to sit down and try to think it through? I don't know him. Yeah. It's an opportunity. I think we, we should wind up because we're coming close, and I, we talked a lot about working landscape and ranching and timbering. Where do you... Do you have a feeling about the value of wilderness or saving the biodiversity and protecting the ecosystem? How do you come down on, on those issues? Well, that's again, you've got to have enough of it in together so that it can function as an ecosystem. Wilderness is really important and uh, I think that we better be careful so we don't start making all these little mini park wilderness things that sort of, here's a subdivision that we're going to have a little something here mm -hmm. that doesn't work you got to have kind a of big mitigation enough. now now mitigation is a dangerous word <laughs> better like watch what's out happened down on Irvine company land oh I think that's a good example yeah yeah be careful because the impact what, what's the danger then? The, it's the density of the projects versus the mitigation which sounds okay but is it big enough and mm -hmm. that's the problem the animals you know you, you Animals need room. Now, there's no two ways about it. And, and in order for them to survive, they've got to be able to move and be migratory and, and, uh, and have some relief from the human. And, and when I say human in the, in the urban areas, uh, uh, remember that all those people have dogs and cats. And they all hunt. Mm -hmm. And they're all running around out there. So you've got to be mindful of that <laughs> on the border, too. So some and of these projects that are sort of leading projects, projects. may not be when so When you great. talk about projects at the Dahon Ranch or Castaic, these are virtually new cities of 30,000 people that they're talking about with uh, cars and, and buildings for offices and jobs. I mean, this is huge. Yeah. And it just, they see this just overwhelms um, the infrastructure, the, the transportation corridors, the sort of physical relief. And that's why when you buy these mitigation, you buy a big hunk of this land that sounds like something is a trade-off mm. to somebody. Is that marginal land that they can't use for anything else? Well, if that's true, what about the critter? I mean, is that the same for them? Are they, mm. you know, are you marginalizing? That's all part of yeah. the deal. And I, I just think, you know, you got, when you think about the grapevine and what's going on at the foot of the grapevine in Kern County, and the amount of, of, of capacity there for storage, and then they want to build a city up there. And I just, it's all not going to work. Beyond me. We got about two minutes if you want to make a well completing statement. Well, as an overview of California, you know, it's still one of the most desirable places and beautiful places in the world. And it offers people this. And the question is have we got enough? resolve amongst ourselves to uh, first start asking the right questions about what do we want mm -hmm. and, and if so what are we going to do to see that we want to uh, maintain this for the future and uh, this can take education and commitment and it's going to take people to take some risks and step up to the plate and say well you know this is the way I see it or, or this is something that's wrong and then let her let her go because you know as short of that uh, you won't you're gonna have to shock people a right. little bit get them up to think oh my god this is but in the in the final analysis these things often after the initial contact people get used to it and once people start geez you know I never thought about that maybe god you know maybe that's not so bad and my as I, I think I told you this has been way back I said, if you can get it down to the coffee table in the local coffee shop, you're getting somewhere. Right, right. But you got to get it there. Maybe get it on the talk shows. Well, that's the place too. But that <laughs> local coffee shop. See, right. once they they're all sitting down there saying, you know, I think maybe this is something we ought to look into or right. something. You're beginning the messages beginning to get somewhere.
Well, we'll hope it does that then. So We're just about out of time. How's that? We did it. Okay. <laughs>